Good afternoon and welcome to Swana Gold Rush Chapter Vision 2020 webinar series. I'm Tim Rively of HDR Engineering and I'm your host today for this uh, first webinar of the series. This series is provided free in lieu of our Western Regional Symposium, which we had to cancel due to COVID-19. Uh, we've taken all those great abstracts, turned them into a webinar series that are brought to you on a monthly basis, one day at noon on a Friday a month, uh, starting in this month in June and running uh, every month through the month, uh, the a year, June of 2021. Please look for those topics uh, that are going to be provided on the Gold Rush Chapter website. Uh, since we had to cancel uh, the Western Regional Symposium, we lost the opportunity to fund our uh, Gold Rush Chapter obligation to the Legislative Task Force, as well as, as the other things um, that we typically gain from or hosting the webinar. And so uh, we are providing an, an opportunity in this webinar series for you to participate as a, uh, as a sponsor to assist us in, in fulfilling those financial needs. Um, keep in mind that the Legislative Task Force is, uh, keeps us informed of all the leg reg leg legislation and regulations that uh, we need to know about. So it's very important to keep this group going. The Legislative Task Force funding and sponsorship uh, is provided in a series of, of levels, all starting starting small and building up escalating levels with escalating optics of being seen as a sponsor participating throughout the series. Uh, please consider your ability to support that and take a look at the levels. Perhaps you can even get a little higher than what we have expected here. Again, we would very much appreciate that. If you have any questions, contact Christine Wolf at Recology. That's C Wolf with an E at recology.com for any questions. And then checks are made available, uh, made payment to, to the Gold Rush chapter. Send them to James Moore. Um, checks and credit cards are accepted. Again, we appreciate your support during this difficult time and we uh, are very grateful to all of our partners. Um, I'd like to spe say a special thank you to the program committee who made this effort available to you. Um, a lot of work has gone into this uh, to make it happen. And that includes Ruth Abbey of Abbey and Associates, Kimberly Cook of Agriman, myself, Tim Rively of HDR Engineering, Lucio Rios of the City of San Jose, and Christine Wolf of Recology. A few quick housekeeping details before we get started. Please mute your phone, keep your computer um, silent so just to prevent background noises. Please turn off your webcam and any kind of video sharing so as to give all the bandwidth to the presenter. Use the chat box for any questions and they will be answered um, by the speaker at the end of the session. And uh, now, as without further ado, I'd like to introduce you Rob Way, <laughs> Rob Hilton of Hilton Farnkoff and Hobson. Uh, Rob and his team have given us a lot of uh, in insight through the last year or two about what is needed for compliance with Senate Bill 1383. And so now we uh, look to Rob to continue that effort and tell us what we need to do uh, to be in compliance going forward. Rob. I've got Tracy Swanborn and Philip Minolfi on the call with me today, and they'll be walking us through um, a bit of this material. And um, I'm going to change my view so that we aren't in the presenter view for all of you. That was not my goal. Um, let's see if that works. So uh, we'll start with Phil walking us through the SB 1383 requirements and some of the things that we're learning as we're doing these planning projects. Phil has been uh, taking the lead uh, throughout HF and H on uh, going through identifying the gaps that agencies have to compliance, figuring out strategies for filling those and uh, assessing the costs and the staffing requirements to get there. So he's gonna be sharing uh, some of that with us. Take it away, Phil. Thanks, Rob. Senate Bill. 1383 was passed in 2016, signed by Governor Brown. The goal was to mitigate short-term climate pollutants, particularly methane and black carbon and hydrofluorocarbons. As far as we're concerned in the solid waste industry, though, it's really the methane generation. And they placed some statewide targets, 50% reduction of organic waste that's currently disposed at landfill by 2020, and 75% reduction of organic waste that's disposed at landfill by 2025. And additionally, they want to recover 20% of edible food that's disposed for human consumption. And it's important to note that these are statewide goals. They're not jurisdiction specific, which unfortunately bound CalRecycle from the freedom we had under AB 939 into more programmatic requirements 
And those programmatic requirements are going to start in 2022 on January 1st. Next slide, Rob. There's also enforcement and fines that kick in in 2024 for non-compliant generators, but really your goal is to get all your programs in place by January 1, 2022. In order to plan your approach and implement your programs, you really need to start by understanding the requirements and everything that's required. So we'll walk through from a high level today. The document regulations is over 150 pages, so it's probably beyond the scope to get into all the weeds today, but we'll cover the high level issues. Then you want to get into a gap analysis of your current franchise agreements or ordinances and programs. And once you determine what the gaps are, you're going to want to identify what potential solutions are because there are options within SB 1383. You want to cost those out, look at the pros and cons of each of the approaches, and then eventually you're going to come up with recommendations and an action plan. It's really important that you communicate with all stakeholders throughout this process, particularly your finance director, city managers, your collectors, processors, maybe your county health department or other regional agencies or jurisdictions. Because if you miss a one stakeholder, it may come back, especially you know, with everything going on in the world now. If you don't loop in your finance director, you may create all these aspirational programs and find out you have a budget deficit and you won't be able to support them. So from a high level, everyone's been referring to 1383 as mandatory organics, but it also requires mandatory service of recycling and trash as well. And there's a couple of mechanisms that we'll go through for compliance there. Um, as a jurisdiction, you'd be responsible for everyone's compliance. So there's inspection requirements and fine requirements starting in 2024 for non-compliant entities. Obviously to implement these programs, you're gonna need to codify them in your ordinances you have to update your procurement policy. Additionally, you'll have to recover edible food and work with edible food generators within your jurisdiction. In order for these programs to be successful, you'll obviously have to educate your generators so that way they understand how to participate in the programs. Since there's gonna be a lot more organic waste going to composting facilities and in vessel digestion, there's gonna be a lot of organic recovered organic waste products and power cycles look to the local jurisdictions to create the market for some of those recovered commodities. And finally, you're gonna have to maintain records and report to CalRecycle. And this is a much more voluminous reporting than we've seen in years past with the electronic annual reports. So we'll touch on all of these topics over the next couple of slides. So as I alluded to, there's program options, and you may notice the options is in quotes there because a lot of times it's dictated by processing capacity in your area or contract contractual agreements you currently have. So one of the options is an unsegregated single container where all of your organics, trash, and recyclables would go in one container. And if you chose this approach, it would have to go to a high diversion MRF, which recovers organics. Starting in 2022, that MRF would have to recover 50% of organics from the container. And by 2024, it would have to recover 75%, or sorry, 2025, it would have to recover 75% of organics. Right now, I'm not aware of a facility that is hitting those recovery rates at a large scale. And it may be a bit ambitious to, to go down that path because if you're not hitting the recovery rates, you'll have to move to a source separated approach. And you'll be on a correction plan with CalRecycle. There's also a two container collection option where you can have a green container and a gray container where the green container would be for your organic waste. And then the gray container would be for your refuse and recyclables. You could choose to put organic waste into the gray container, but then it would have to go to a high diversion. Mode. Alternatively, you could use a blue container for your recyclables and a gray container for your organics and your refuse. And again, that gray container would have to go to a high diversion mark to recover the organics. Your fourth option, or I guess third option, 3A, would be a three container system. And in that system, you would have what we typically think of an organics container, which is green, a blue container for recyclables, and a refuse container for discard, and the gray container. This is a good approach because it minimizes your footprint. If you move to a four container system with source separated food waste in the downtown area, you'd have a much harder time. You'd have more separation for your residents or businesses. But also the three container stream likely won't be as clean as if you had the additional separation options, which allows you to have a brown container for just your food waste. So then you could have green, blue, gray, and brown, 
And additionally, they allow you to use split cards if you want to minimize the footprint. It's important to think about kind of the cost associated with the different collection systems. Sorry, I'll be back up one slide. Um, if you go from a three container to a four container, you're looking at 60 to $70 per cart for every home and business. And you're also probably going to need an extra collection truck, which would cost up to $400,000. So there's a lot of capital investment that would go along with adding more carts. Now I'm going to do the next one, Rob. So as I had alluded to, you're ultimately responsible for generators for uh, compliance with the regulations. So beginning in January 2022, you have to do a desktop compliance review of commercial solid waste accounts and multifamily accounts with more than two cubic yards of solid waste service. And this is a desktop review to see if they have organic waste and recycling service on site. Additionally, you're going to be responsible for contamination monitoring. And there's two approaches to this. You could do route reviews where you have to go through annually and check at least every single route for contamination. Or alternatively, you could do waste evaluations where you're doing waste sorts at a transfer station or landfill. In every single instance that we've costed out except for one, the route reviews have been cheaper. And in that instance, the waste evaluations were only cheaper because the hauler was running weekly routes, so they could do less evaluations than a lot of the haulers that we were costing out that were doing daily routes. The, while it's also cheaper to do the route review, the waste evaluation is better if you have aspirational zero waste goals and you really want to understand what's in your waste stream. And as you complete either of these tasks, you have to educate people you find to be non-compliant. So if you're doing route reviews, you can just put a tag on their container and move along. If you're doing waste evaluations and you find contamination, you're going to be sending education to every single customer on that route. So that obviously adds some costs as well. After January 1, 2024, you're going to have to issue notices of violation and then follow up to see if they've corrected. If not, then you're going to have to issue a penalty to them for their first offense and then the time frame ramps up as they offend more. Next slide, Rob. So as I mentioned, you have to have ordinances and policies. You're gonna to need to codify all of this in order to make it legally required. Um, you're gonna need a recycling and organics ordinance to make it mandatory for all gen generators. And for those of, who don't subscribe to mandatory service, you're gonna to need to regulate those self haulers and back haulers via an ordinance. Now you're not technically required to make self haulers, back haulers or edible food recovery agencies report to you as a jurisdiction. But ultimately, you're responsible for reporting that information to Cal Recycle. So it's probably prudent to require them to report to you so you don't have to go out to their place of business and ask them for the records at the end of the year. You need to implement a Cal Green Building Standards Ordinance as well and the Model Water Efficient Landscaping Ordinance. Obviously, you're going to have to regulate your haulers using it if you're using a franchise system or non exclusive system. And another thing you have to do is have procurement policies. And we'll go into a couple of these different requirements in the next couple slides. So for edible food recovery requirements, jurisdictions are responsible for identifying tier one and tier two commercial edible food generators. And we'll talk about what those are on, in the next slide. Um, you also have to implement edible food recovery programs to educate commercial generators. And there's multiple ways you could approach this. You could figure out who the generators are, which you're doing under one of your requirements and just send a mailer to them or you could include this information in your mass mailer that is required for other requirements and other parties. And that way you don't have to go through the headache of trying to just single out certain people for the education. Although you may want to send more targeted education, more volume of it. It's more of a policy decision. You're gonna to have to increase edible food capacity. If there's not enough capacity. So that, we recommend typically taking a regional approach to that and hunger does cross borders and there's going to be Food recovery organizations and food recovery services operating in your jurisdiction that aren't domiciled out of your jurisdiction and maybe a town over. So a regional approach might help with increasing the capacity. And then you're gonna have to inspect commercial edible food generators to make sure they have a contract with the food recovery organization or food recovery service and that they're maintaining records and also that they're properly sorting their, their edible food. And we've seen a lot of uh, talk amongst attorneys and county councils on this since theoretically you don't have the legal right to go into the back of a building unless you're a health inspector because you can pull the health permit or a fire inspector but a policeman couldn't walk into the back of a building to inspect trash if a resident told them they couldn't 
So something to consider, you may have more stakeholders to involve. So as I mentioned, there's tier one and tier two. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all of the different types of generators, but the important thing to, to kind of note here is that tier one is your shelf stable food, such as supermarkets, canned food, and food distributors, where tier two is where you get into restaurants and hotels. There was a much larger focus on food safety in tier two. Obviously your food will have to be frozen or taken to the appropriate temperatures to be food safe, where if it's a wholesale food distributor, it's likely canned goods with a longer shelf life. So you're annually required to provide generators, including self haulers with information about organic waste prevention, the benefits of it, on-site recycling. And it's important here to note that it's all generators. In the past, typically education was sent to customers via franchise agreements or collectors. But if you have a multifamily property, then you'd be sending it maybe to someone in Arizona who owns the building and it wouldn't be going to every generator. So you likely would need to use a USPS every door direct mailer or an avenue like that that goes to every single unit in a multifamily apartment or a commercial strip mall. Beginning in January of 2022, you're required to purchase organic waste products, recovered organic waste, organic waste products. And those include compost, mulch, renewable gas, and electricity. And we'll talk about some of those volumes and, and what are some strategies in the coming slides. And then you're also required to purchase paper products and printer printing and paper consistent with the public contract code, which just says if recovered materials are the same price or less than virgin materials, you have to go with the recovered. And at, at this point, there's about a 30% markup on recovered content paper and with everything going on globally. I don't know if that's going to get any lower anytime soon, but you are responsible for documenting and keeping track of that. So here's a quick chart, I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but I encourage you to look on the left and identify the population of your jurisdiction. And then you can see the columns to the right have, a, have the different uh, commodities you could use to meet your procurement goals. We've seen a lot of people that have been attempting to use mulch. And one thing to consider if you're using mulch is that the way that the formula is set up is you're going to have to buy a lot more mulch than you will compost. And because you're limited based on tons and not really volume in the transportation sector, you're going to be paying a lot more transportation for the mulch than you will for compost. So while it's nice to get the mulch off your yard and have quicker tier times, it might make more sense from a transportation, transportation perspective to procure compost. And if you look at those compost numbers, it, it's pretty clear that a compost giveaway is probably not the appropriate solution. You're, no, you're not going to give away 17,400 cubic yards of compost if you're a medium-sized city doesn't seem feasible. You might have to use a combination of approaches. In a lot of the instances we've costed, RNG has been the cheapest solution, but you also need to have access to infrastructure for RNG and also getting wheeling agreements may be difficult. An important note here is that the RNG has to be derived from California organic waste, which also adds to the cost because in California to inject into the pipeline, you need to have cleaner RNG than anywhere else in America. So you're gonna be paying more for not just RNG, but it's gonna have to be California RNG. And finally, there's enhanced record keeping and reporting requirements. There's an initial compliance report, which is due April 1st, and that's gonna include all your ordinances and agreements to facilitate compliance. And there also, there's one other item, which is every item included in the annual report. It's still a little bit ambiguous as to how you would include all of the annual report information, because by April 1st, you would only have likely January and February data, if that, from your collectors and your other entities. Um, and then every year, you're gonna have to report in August or October for the entire previous year, so. It's much more voluminous than the previous EARs. If you look over to the right, you can see in the annual report, you have to report on everything we've talked about so far today. And if you were to just take a look at the collection system, you have to describe all the different type of collection systems that you offer. So if you have a non-exclusive franchise or maybe multiple descriptions, you need to have a number of people subscribe to every different type of system, whether or not you can use compostable bags. And if you're using high diversion MRF, which facility you're using, so the, the requirements are quite voluminous and you can imagine as you go through all the waivers and everything else, there's, there's a lot to report. And additionally, you need an implementation record, which is 
all of the records of everything we've talked about, if you issue a violation, it has to go in there. If you issue someone a waiver, the waiver needs to be put in the implementation record. And it needs to be housed in a central location. It can be physical or electronic. And it has to be made available to CalRecycle within 10 days. And additionally, all the records have to be placed in the implementation record within 60 days of the event, which is effectively moving everyone to monthly reporting. Because if your hauler issues a contamination tag on January 1st and they report 30 days, 20 days after the month, you're not getting that report till February 20th, which is 50 days later. Quarterly reporting wouldn't get it into the implementation record within time. And now that we've kind of digested the regs a little bit, and drank out of the fire hose, we're going to talk about the gap analysis and how we're going to plan for compliance. Again, communicate with all stakeholders. Um, for compliance analysis, you're going to want to use a checklist. The regs are very prescriptive. While there's options, there, you do want to use a checklist because there's so many of them and you may miss one. Include source references as you're going through your franchise agreements and ordinances and checklists. So if you get it from section five of your franchise agreement, write that down because you're probably going to be referencing this checklist for the next year while you're designing programs. So to have a, a nice index of where everything is is helpful. After you've identified your gaps, you're going to want to sit down and think about what options you have to comply and fill these gaps. You're going to want to start with a qualitative analysis and understanding your specific region and areas and all the politics involved and your relationships. And then you're going to want to also plan, look at the costing before you plan the projected responsibilities. Next slide, Rob. So here's an example of one, one requirement in SB 1383, which is to annually provide businesses you generate edible food with education. So you have to ask yourself who's going to do that and not just is it the hauler or the city it's, or county, it's gonna be who specifically, who's designing it, who's gonna review it, who's gonna draft the text. All of these things start to add up and you have, especially as you have layers and PIOs and everything else. So that all factors into the cost. And while you're thinking about that, do you want to do it yourself because you're unhappy with some of the educational material you've had in the past or do you really love your franchisee's graphic designer and you want, you want it to be consistent with the other material that's going out? You're also going to have to focus on how it's going to be disseminated in quarterly in newsletters or bill inserts typically won't work since it's not reaching all generators. Next slide, Ron. So after you do your qualitative analysis, you want to come up with a list of some recommended programs. And it doesn't have to be a singular program. You could have options within this list. But the goal is to have a working document so you can start evaluating the costs and the pros and cons of each of the different approaches. So that way, as you move forward through your elected bodies, you have a, some backup and a description of all of the considerations you've made and make it easier to get it through. So here's an example of a cost analysis that we did for one city. And this was a very, uh, I guess, optimistic and enthusiastic city that is very concentrated on zero waste. So they had a very high public education cost for rolling out containers to everyone, kitchen pails. They wanted to do door-to-door -door technical assistance for every single unit. But the important thing here to note is that you're going to have one-time costs and ongoing costs, and they vary widely. So you want to keep an eye on, you know, what is your one-time cost going to be for this year, but also looking to the future. And as you look to the future for ongoing costs, you need to think about things like tonnage growth in the organic sector for processing and population growth, you're going to have more generators, so you may have more education costs. Next slide, Rob. And here's a sample staff analysis, which is similar to the cost, but it figures out how many employees you're going to need. You estimate the hours for all of the tasks and responsibilities and you can divide them by 2,080 hours to get to an FTE equivalent. And again, it's kind of interesting to see the difference between the one-time FTEs and the ongoing FTEs. And in row one there, you can see implementing mandatory organics takes much, much more effort to roll out than it does to serve us on an ongoing basis since they had some availability on their route for more volume in the truck. And if you really want to be overzealous and enthusiastic, then you can do a, a cost benefit analysis where you estimate the diversion potential of each of the different programs. And by weighing that against the cost, you can come up to an estimated cost per diverted ton, especially in times when resources are finite, you might want to do that to figure out which programs are the best bang for your buck. There's quite a bit to consider as 
as you look at the staffing and rate impacts, I'm sure you saw a wide range as we skim through those slides quickly. Um, some of the primary drivers are the number of service providers. If you have non-exclusive system, it's going to be a lot more haulers to regulate, a lot more information to collect and maintain your implementation record. You have to coordinate with more parties. Municipal versus private collections also a very large driver of costs. If you're a municipal collector, you can't delegate the cost to your hauler who just build it into the rates. It's going to be affecting your municipal budget if you have to go and run the reports of complaints and do all the education yourself. The extent of the exemptions and waivers you offer is also important. You can decide to go with mandatory service. You're not required to offer waivers, and that would minimize the burden on staff to fulfill that. Although you may have some angry residents, so maybe you choose you want to offer waivers because you're you're worried about angry business members and community members. But that's going to add significant labor for your staff to follow up on those waivers. The number of streams again is going to impact the staffing, particularly for municipal collectors. And this, whether you choose standard performance based does impact the rates, but we've noticed it doesn't impact them significantly. The performance based compliance seems to be more vanity concessions, such as you don't have to do all of the education, but in practice, you're never going to hit the diversion standards required if you're not educating the generators on how to use the programs. Then you have the extent of delegation is one of the primary drivers as well. You can delegate this via franchise agreement or an MOU, which is going to minimize the cost impact on your budget, although ultimately the ratepayers will be seeing the cost. In economies of scale, if, you're, if you have a larger community, then you're obviously going to have lower cost per unit. And there's also the minimum compliance versus best practices that you're going to have to weigh. For example, the education requires just once a year education to everyone. But if you're rolling out new programs, then you're likely going to want to send some education prior so residents just don't have containers showing up on their front doors. So you're going to want to determine where you want to go above and beyond. As we had alluded to in reporting, the edible food recovery agencies and self haulers aren't required to report to the municipalities, but their municipalities are required to report to CalRecycle. So you may want to require them to report to you as a mechanism to report to the state. And then the implementation demand and ongoing demand we touched on, it wide, widely varies. In the beginning, when you're designing programs, you're probably going to be more involved with public works directors, attorneys, city managers, and finance directors. And as you move in, it's going to be more operational staff, more recycling coordinators, and purchasing department. So you need to consider not just how many employees, but what type of employees they are. And here's a couple examples of staffing ranges from projects we've done recently. So again, I encourage you to look on the left at a population similar to yours and look at the one time and the ongoing FTE requirements. And Robbie, we'll just leave that up for a second so people can pick the, the jurisdiction closest to them. Okay, so we kind of touched on this and threaded it throughout, but it's, it's really important to have historical perspective of your community and all the politics going on. If you have a hiring freeze, you know, maybe doing the cost benefit analysis isn't as important because you can't hire someone internally and you may have to go hire a consultant or do it through a franchise agreement. So that's always something to consider. If your jurisdiction has a is really adamant about their climate action plan and they have a green committee, then maybe you want to go above and beyond and it's not just the low cost option you want to pursue. And then you want to look at the costs as well. So you have all the information when you go to your elected officials and when you go to negotiate agreements or change your ordinances. And you really want it to be based on local costs. You, you don't want to just grab a different city from down the road and what their cost was. You want to tailor it to your scenario and what your situation is. And then you want to be collaborative with all of the stakeholders. You don't want to have your solid waste department saying, oh, county health is going to do all the inspections without talking to county health, because if that's your plan and you get to January 1, 2022, and they say, no, we're not doing it, you're going to have some problems. And now that we've kind of talked about the education, how you're going to plan as an agency, Rob's going to walk into some regional approaches that we've worked with and seen and how those have impacted costs and staffing. All right, thank you, Phil. So I'm gonna 
go through uh, some of the discussions that we've been having with uh, our clients that are either joint powers authorities or counties um, about the role of uh, regional agencies uh, in these different functions that Phil just walked us through. And uh, you'll note that I don't have any specific agencies example of here's all the stuff we're ready to commit to today, uh, because that's really been a struggle for regional agencies to uh, get their hands around the specific needs of their member communities and to uh, work with their elected bodies about the role of uh, the, the regional agency versus the member agency versus the uh, private sector partners that get involved in each of these situations. So um, I'll say all of that to say that uh, these are a discussion of potential things that regional agencies could do and, and that regional agencies are thinking about doing for their member agencies right now. Um, but each of, each of those decisions is going to be local and very contextual. So uh, for collection and processing, obviously the extent of regional coordination is going to have a lot to do with um, what role that regional agency already plays in the marketplace. So if the regional agency already holds the franchise agreements and manages the franchise agreements, uh, they're going to be more involved in those things, in negotiating the agreement, in uh, defining how the collection programs are going to get adjusted. Um, on the other hand, if they're very involved in providing the processing or disposal infrastructure, then they're probably going to be more focused in supporting their member agencies in those areas, right? So uh, what we've seen um, out there is a strong desire to have common program features and to regionalize uh, a lot of the options that are available to you that Phil just described. Um, and to have those things done as consistently as possible um, across the region, both from a cost economy perspective, as well as the uh, public education and outreach benefits, right? People will understand the system better. Um, lots of agencies talking about either uh, model franchise agreements or negotiating um, as a group through franchises to uh, economize that process and to facilitate making sure things are done in a fairly consistent way. Um, and then a number of agencies, particularly those that already have some experience with facilities uh, that are really gearing up around uh, either developing or expanding their own facilities or uh, banding together and contracting with third parties as a group for uh, the processing requirements that are out there. On monitoring and enforcement coordination, as Phil described, um, we've found that the route monitoring, the lid flipping approach has been a low cost option. And um, there are real economies of scale um, for a lot of things in 1383, but these lid flipping things are not really one of them. They scale because of the size of the routes and, and a lot of the effort um, is tied to that. Um, and it's also sort of a discrete one-time activity, unless you're a very, very large agency uh, this is sort of a part-time function that you could have somebody coming in and doing periodically. So the regional agencies have talked about, you know, is there an opportunity for us to contract as a group for this um, route monitoring activity, um, or does it maybe make more sense for our hauler to do it? Um, the desk review of accounts that was talked about, obviously, if the information is the same, if the hauler is the same for all of the agencies, that makes a lot of sense. If you have uh, different haulers and different uh, information systems among uh, the member agencies, that makes less sense. Uh, the edible food generator inspections, as um, Phil talked about, we've been hearing a lot about uh, Article 4 unlawful search issues and concerns from legal counsel. Um, and they, they really do not want to have a situation where um, a recycling coordinator or even a code enforcement officer is uh, asserting their right to enter property without a warrant. Um, and they really are looking at the health inspector or maybe even the fire inspector uh, as potential options there. And so in those cases for enforcement, it may really be that the best person to do the enforcement uh, is the health inspector. That won't be popular with county health in most places, but uh, there may be some revenue opportunities. And I really think it's it's the most economic way to do that, and it gets the right people looking at the issue that are trained appropriately. Uh, and then lastly, in terms of enforcement actions, uh, you have to be clear that it can only be delegated to public agencies. Um, the, the regulations are very clear that you can't delegate enforcement to a private uh, party. 
the economies of scale really are significant for enforcement because there shouldn't be a whole lot of it. And so pooling that activity um, makes a lot of sense, but it depends on your administrative process. If ultimately you pool the investigations and the documentation, uh, but the enforcement has to happen at each individual agency because of police power issues, um, then you may erode some of those benefits. So you really have to look at what are the powers we have and how does this work in our situation? Um, on procurement coordination, we've heard a lot of pushback on um, coordinating around the paper products uh, thing. That's not really something that has a lot of um, value to the coordination and each agency obviously has their own purchasing departments and has to do the tracking um, around that independently. Uh, on the recovered organic waste products, though, the mulch and the compost and the RNG, there seems to be more uh, logic in working as a group on that, and especially those that own uh, compost facilities, uh, it's very easy to come into possession of compost and then uh, find a use for that. It's called selling it. Um, so there are, are setups like that where regional agencies may be able to um, really leverage their position if they're a service provider. Um, also, with organizing uh, wheeling agreements for RNG to the extent that you've got regional agencies that maybe are providing the vehicle parking uh, and fueling infrastructure. Uh, ordinance coordination really depends on the specifics of, of the area. Um, there's a lot of discussion about model ordinances and cooperating in that uh, way and, and in the regional agencies supporting uh, education of local city councils. Um, but to the extent that uh, each of the cities holds their solid waste powers um, separately, um, they have to pass their own ordinances, right? Uh, JPAs with delegated powers are looking at uh, primary adoption of the ordinances and development, and that's just how they're built, and so it's sort of natural for them to do that. One of the big areas that we see um, the regional thing being really critical is inedible food recovery coordination. Uh, Phil talked a bit about that, so I'm not going to belabor it, but um, there are a number of really good organizations out there, countywide or regional uh, organizations that do this work. Um, and I think it's really a matter of sort of connecting with them. Counties, particularly because of their uh, requirement to develop and uh, support the infrastructure and sort of track the metrics around this can be a good, um, good focus point for that. Um, and a lot of counties, as I say, already have some infrastructure around that. There seems to be a lot more interest around um, coordinating around education and outreach. Uh, we've seen the what goes where apps and widgets going on to help with the contamination management and the um, source separation education, um, label and signage wizards um, to help folks uh, get the signage right at each place. And so as you do that, there's this design cost that whether you do it for the large group or each individual agency, there are these benefits and uh, we are seeing more willingness to cooperate uh, around that stuff. And again, a desire to have common programs. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy Swanborn, who has been leading our work with CalRecycle to develop some of the uh, tools that you will need as local agencies and service providers to implement these various requirements. Uh, and Tracy's also been leading our work throughout the state on uh, getting 1383 compliant franchise agreements and ordinances together. So she's got some interesting perspective on this. Thank you, Rob, and good afternoon, everybody. I sure wish we were all together in person because it looks like a fantastic group of people joined this webinar today. Uh, Rob and Phil have talked in great detail about all the requirements and some of the planning steps that need to be taken. And no doubt, some of you are already moving ahead and have made great headway, and others are just beginning to really figure out how to tackle this. Power Cycle recognizes that it's a major undertaking, and that's why they have engaged HF&H along with our sub-consultants, Diversion Strategies, and Deborah Kaufman Consulting to prepare a couple of tools to help jurisdictions and other entities work towards compliance. So I'm gonna spend the next couple of minutes and give you a really high level overview of these four models, the franchise agreement, a model organics disposal reduction ordinance, a procurement policy and edible food recovery agreement. So on the next slide, before I dive into the details, I wanna talk about the objectives of the models broadly. If you could advance one slide, Rob, that would be great. CalRecycle, as I said, they understand that this is a big lift. So that's why they wanted to prepare these tools to help 
various parties do their planning and implementation work. One of the important criteria for Cal Recycle was that HF and H just didn't prepare these tools in isolation. We did quite a bit of research to gather examples of agreements and ordinances and other policies as part of the research and drew from those. But we also organized a group of experts that we called the resource groups. And we had three of them engaged throughout the process, providing input, reviewing the models, and sharing their feedback. And I know we have at least two on the line today. So a shout out to Larry Sweetser and Tim Flanagan. And I apologize if I missed anyone else. I tried to scan the list, but may have missed somebody. So it was really valuable to have that input. I think you'll all find that these models will provide great resources as well as guidance in terms of thinking about different compliance strategies and methods for integrating the SB 1383 requirements into your agreements and ordinances and policies. In fact, there's a lot of detail and content built in in what we call guidance notes uh, where we reference the applicable regulatory sections and explain when various provisions are applicable and, and give people sort of a roadmap for how to use the documents. And lastly, and sort of most primarily, the models, you know, provide you example provisions that you can use as you're developing your agreements, ordinances, and policies. I should mention, um, that the tools aren't available yet. I'm sure most of you have heard about these tools coming. Cal Recycle will be releasing them when the regulations are finalized. So we're queued up for that. You just need to wait till those regs are final. So now let me talk about each of the tools specifically, and I'll move quickly through these, um, but I want to start with the franchise agreement. It follows, the model follows a very typical framework, and we've built in and focused on those sections that are related to SB 1383. So we've really tackled collection, contamination monitoring, waivers, um, education and outreach. We have a little bit on food recovery, we have processing. And within those sections, we've actually been able to draw on over a dozen franchise, over two dozen franchise agreements that already had constructed specific SB 1383 provisions. We were able to compile all those examples draw that language into the model when it made sense. And in some cases, we did have to draft new provisions where we had gaps, but we were able to lean on a lot of existing language. One of the key objectives was to provide a lot of optionality. Uh, Cal Recycle and ourselves recognize that jurisdictions are very different. They have different service conditions, they have different needs, they have different infrastructure um, and different you know, contracting arrangements. So we have built in dozens and dozens of options within the model with guidance notes on when those are applicable. So for example, contamination monitoring, it may be that the jurisdiction takes that on and needs some cooperation from the hauler. We have a provision that outlines that scenario. We also have a provision that outlines the scenario of delegating the contamination monitoring directly to the hauler. So we've got lots of optionality that hopefully allows jurisdictions to create a custom solution to their needs. And we envision that the model can be used in two ways. It can be used if you're starting from scratch and you know building out a new agreement, or it can be used if you're amending your existing contract or preparing a separate SB 1383 amendment to your contract. You can pull the language out and adapt it to your needs. Also possible the haulers and processors may look at the model as they're sitting down and negotiating with the jurisdictions that they support. The second model is the ordinance. Um, SB 1383 requires that jurisdictions uh, adopt an enforceable ordinance or similar mechanism. And the purpose of this model is to provide an example for that. We've built in the mandatory requirements for all generators to comply with SB 1383 through collection programs, or self-hauling. We've covered the hauler requirements and edible food recovery requirements. We built in some simple provisions around CalGreen and MWILO that address specifically the SB 1383 items of CalGreen and MWILO that were called out. It doesn't include like a very comprehensive CalGreen or MWILO, and I think most jurisdictions are already in compliance in this area. It also has a section on requiring uh, recycled content paper product purchases by your vendors that may be appropriate for the ordinance and other jurisdictions may feel that's better for their purchasing policies 
um, and contracts directly with their vendors. And lastly, it outlines inspections and enforcements. Well, we did look at some, uh, some examples on the ordinance. Most of the language in the ordinance actually reflects the specific language out of the regulations. And that's highlighted in green, so you can clearly see that. The third model is a procurement policy. This is designed to help jurisdictions come into compliance with the annual procurement target for the compost, mulch, renewable gas, and the recycled paper content. Um, so it provides language um, that you could build into existing procurement policies, or you could structure um, a new procurement policy specifically around these SB 1383 targets. It also includes rep record keeping provisions. And this is really important because one thing about the procurement arrangements is it's likely to impact several departments within your jurisdiction. And all of those departments will need to be uh, documenting and reporting their compliance, whether you, they're using compost and mulch like public works and uh, maybe your parks department, but also the paper procurement impacts all departments unless you have centralized purchasing. And then the last tool is the model edible food recovery agreement. SB 1383, as Philip mentioned, requires that the tier one and tier two generators have contracts or written agreements with food recovery organizations and service providers. And the intent of this model is to provide a framework for that. We're looking for probably the jurisdictions to educate those parties that this model is available. Um, like the other tools, we've built in a lot of customization. We have sections on identifying the types of food that's accepted, uh, donation rejection protocols, equipment that's needed for the storage and transportation of the materials and who is providing that food storage equipment and transportation services. Also sections on whether fees are charged for the service and there's optionality built in so that this can be customized to different users. So the four model tools will be released, as I said, when the regulations are finalized. Um, Hoping that sooner rather than later, but certainly, you know, get on their listserv, CalRecycle's listserv, if you aren't already on it, to make sure that you hear the announcements about the regs and the model tools. We do have a few resources available now. CalRecycle engaged us to prepare eight case studies that really align sort of with the four model tools, and there are examples of entities that have already implemented programs that help them come into compliance with the SB 1383 requirements around these different topic areas. The link to those case studies are on the bottoms of the slide. So if you haven't seen these case studies yet, feel free to take a look at those. That concludes our presentation today. Thank you so much. And I think we have a few minutes now for Q&A. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. I appreciate that. Uh, Tim Riley here. Apparently, my presentation at the beginning of this didn't, didn't come through to anybody, so my apologies for that. And I would have said the chat box is where you need to ask questions, and I see Derek has taken advantage of providing several, and I think we should go back and, and let him uh, field those questions, uh, Tracy and Rob. The first one Derek asked was he's on a, uh, a hiring freeze. What about that, given his uh, city situation? <laughs> Yeah, a number of agencies obviously are in hiring freezes right now, and um, the idea of adding new staff is going to be um, a non-starter in some some situations. Um, you've got some delegation options, and so whether you delegate to your hauler or to an outreach firm um, or to somebody that uh, will do bits and pieces of this for you in terms of the reporting or, or the tracking, um, there are a number of uh, different third-party providers out there for different pieces of uh, the compliance puzzle. And so it may be a matter of uh, getting more creative with your contracting out strategies. But I think the broader issue is going to be the political will to pay. And um, CalRecycle has uh, stated over and over again that that's not one of the things that they uh, have to have to worry about in their regulations. They're um, asserting that these are not unfunded mandates and that we can raise revenues and find ways to, to fund these things. So they're expecting that local agencies will find ways to do that despite the challenges that we have right now. Derek, thank you. Derek asked, also asked about uh, the tools. They said the tools are not ready and uh, that the, it will be a shift to the compliance dates. 
No. Um, you know, the compliance dates are set in statute. And so CalRecycle, I'm not speaking for them, but just my understanding of the situation is that uh, they aren't able to do that without uh, an act of the legislature. So the 2022 and 2024 are the dates. Okay. Um, my apologies to everyone for not getting my uh, my introduction out, but I want to do want to close up with one thing, and that was that um, because Western Regional Symposium was canceled, we do have this webinar series that we've we're hosting um, one hour a day, uh, one day a month for the next twelve months. It's a pretty enormous effort, and um, it was really put on by the um, program committee, which I have a great much of gratitude for, um, and. and uh, but as a part of that, we don't have the funding mechanism to pay for Western Regional, um, the funds we would have normally got for the for the legislative task force. So there is a, a slide deck that was showed prior to this presentation, and it'll be on on Gold Rush uh, Chapters website later. But essentially, it's a, um, a series of three different contribution levels you can sponsor. And since this is a free pre program, we expect there was a there was 70 of us, 72 at the peak. We expect it to be a really high participation rate. We hope that you will find a way to to uh, to, to participate as a as a sponsor going forward. Um, and then I, uh, I do really appreciate the the program committee that put all this together: Ruth Abbey, Kimberly Cook, um, Celia Rios, and Christine Wolf. Um, and I think that's it. I'm looking for more questions. Um, again, my apologies. I had a really cool introduction with a Happy Friday. Um, introduction it didn't make it um let's see cal recycle looks like ruth is asking a question will you be developing a requirements checklist that phil referred to no that uh is not part of our scope of work with cal recycle um any of the local agencies on the call are welcome to give us a call and we're happy to uh, provide that to you though Tim Israel asks if, uh, generally speaking, which county departments, health or waste, are stepping up and taking the lead on edible food recovery programs? I know that's been an issue here in Sacramento. It's It's been um, different departments in different places, and it's usually whoever was connected um, to the feeding mission. And so typically it's been health and human services um, but or public health. Um, but different agencies organize that differently. And in some agencies, it's even their sustainability departments that have kind of taken this on. So um, somebody in your agency is working on this issue, uh, especially right now, actually, and with um, the unemployment rates the way they are, a number of our clients have found that uh, the feeding organization sort of came out of the woodwork and a lot of the challenges that they might have had um, in finding who those folks were and what they were doing uh, have gone away. They they now know and they're asking for help. And so this is a good opportunity maybe to, to make those connections because you're going to need them. I, I think it's not really asked the question here, but in, in general, I've heard this back and forth given the COVID and some of the other things. Is there any discussion of a legislative remedy to the timeframes? Well, I'm not on the LTF, and I think we probably have LTF members on this call, but uh, I've heard of two different um, efforts, one to delay the implementation dates by a year or two, and another one to add a good faith effort provision to the regulations. Um, obviously, those are both speculative and under the uh, cautious and, and sort of overwhelmed um, nature of the legislature right now. Um, they're they're sort of being careful about what more they're taking on and and being selective given the heavy issues they've got to deal with. So I don't know if this fits their profile of what they want to take on. Okay, um, we have another minute here. Mark Bowers asks on agency procurement requirements: Do you see an opportunity to comply by getting credit for purchasing compost or mulch? For uh, use by others. You got it, Tom, or <laughs> you got it, Tim. Um, Mark's Mark's comment is exactly right. I think a number of agencies are going to look at approaches where they sort of take possession on paper, but never in reality, um, or some large portion of it will be moved that way. Because as we've talked to agencies about how much of this they could use, uh, even the most aggressive ones are saying maybe a couple of thousand cubic yards a year for field dressing and medians and things like that, but. Um, we can't absorb this kind of requirement in our municipal operations, so we're going to have to find some way of brokering it out, as as Mark described. You're right. Thank you, and you can see those chats. Appreciate it. 
Um, I think we're at the top of the hour. Are there any more chats, any more questions from anyone? Not seeing any. Well, again, thank you, Rob, Tracy, and Phil for your presentation. And uh, please look at the Gold Rush Chapter website for sponsorship opportunities going forward. Everyone have a great Friday, great weekend. Be safe. Bye now.